Hello, Richard Anderson, Principal of St. John's Grammar. Uh, St. John's is a independent Anglican school pitched in beautiful Bel Air with 900 students and 150 staff. And we were impacted like everyone else um, with COVID. The impact of COVID on our school was profound in many ways. Um, we did have to close the school for three weeks just prior to holidays, uh, we anticipated that we would have to shut down longer. And we certainly had families that were really worried about children attending uh, a school environment for many weeks. So we had a situation where we almost had a hybrid model of delivering uh, the educational experience where we had students who were wished to stay at home and plenty of students who wished to come to school. So we had this two-way bimodal delivery of learning. Uh, that was a huge challenge for our staff. They had to put in numerous extra hours for in preparation to be able to do that successfully. It was just so important that we also ensured that we looked after our community. So it was not just about lessons and maths and English, it was about people's well-being and dealing with all the anxiety and worry and stress of not just COVID, but also the interruption to the normal. So that was a real challenge for our team. COVID has made us rethink and reflect on some parts of schooling. Um, that, that notion that um, 8.30 to 3.30, the traditional time slot for schooling uh, is best practice, has really been turned on its head. You do not have to jam the learning experience in a confined space of time. And in fact, our students have let us know that there was um, some great virtues in coming to school and um, being at home to do their study. Um, extending the day, that's what it did. It, it allowed uh, young people to regulate the learning experience during the week. Um, and we have really thought long and hard now about how we might set up uh, the school week for our, in the future. Um, it also has um, sharpened our skills, obviously, in the delivery of remote learning through the use of technology and the schools um, looking next year to venture into delivering a SACE experience for uh, international students. And we're on the, the cusp of signing some contracts there because we've realised and developed some real skills in that area. Welcome colleagues. My name is Luca Parry and it's my joyful pleasure to be the convener, the MC of this webinar here today going beyond the brave new world, COVID-19 and its implications for well-being and technology in learning environments. Uh, I'm joining you from Ghana, Yarta, so I'd like to say Nina Mani and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend those respects to all of us joining from across this beautiful country of Australia. I'd also like to say kia ora and say hello to any of our New Zealand colleagues and friends across the Tasman that are joining us from the beautiful island of the long white cloud. As you've just heard in this first mini case study, this is a really incredible moment. And we've seen this pandemic impact, not just the way that we learn, but frankly, the way that we live, our ability to access nature, to go outside, an enormous range of implications. And so our big question that frames this work in terms of going beyond the, you know, the normal is how could we reimagine and remake our learning environments so that our learning experiences are richer and deeper and more empowering across the ways that we contribute in the education ecosystem. Today, we have four brilliant speakers that will be joining us and, and sharing their unique you know, perspective from their vantage point and the work that they do. But interspersed will be these mini case studies from the field, from schools, from learners, students, teachers, architects, everyone contributing to trying to redesign the learning experience so that it is truly empowering. 
So we're going to throw into a few case studies in a moment, but I really invite you to make this as interactive as possible. Please go into the chat box, introduce yourself, share where you're coming from, make sure you select panelists and attendees so that you're talking to yourselves as well as just to the panel. Uh, and any questions as well, drop those into the Q&A box. And I, as the MC, will be looking at those and sharing those at the end of today's kind of presentation part so that we can try to delve into some of the concepts that are covered. Uh, we're gonna dive into three quick mini case studies now before I invite our first speaker to, to really take us through the scene of, of wellbeing science and what we're learning from the teacher that COVID-19 is. Hi, I'm Anna C. Morrison and I'm in year eight at St. John's Grammar School. To keep connected during COVID online learning, I rung and FaceTimed my friends and had a chat. I also spoke to my family and I spoke to about three different people this way every day. So I was able to stay connected with most people who I would usually see in my everyday life. I also used online Zoom chats to talk with my other students and teachers during online lessons. After COVID online learning, I have a better understanding of how socially based everyday school life and in communities we are. I now understand the importance of social connection for our health and well-being. We are so lucky because our school is based in South Australia and we were able to go back to regular learning after only a short amount of time doing the online learning. I'm happy now to be back at school in the community with my friends. Hi there, my name's Ethan and I'm from Xavier College in Gawler. Um, I have been undertaking Year 12 this year and I've been really fortunate to go to such an amazing school. We have some fantastic teachers here and some fantastic facilities and it's a great environment. Um, and I was really thriving at the start of Year 12. But then, of course, COVID came along and that really, uh, that really put the brakes on everything. So um, we moved to online learning for a period of time and we all uh, really studied from home at that point in time. Uh, personally, I thrived uh, learning online from home. I feel like the school environment that I'd been in had really, um, really set me up well to just uh, seamlessly transition uh, to study from home. I know some students really struggled um, with the online learning side of things. However, I really thrived from it. And I found that uh, the technology side of things, in particular, uh, the teachers had already been um, had already been uploading our assignments and, and putting our classes um, online. So when we transitioned to online learning, um, all our work was mostly already there. So I found uh, personally it was really great uh, online learning. I'm Sue Dugdale. I'm an architect, and I've practiced in Alice Springs in Central Australia for many years. Uh, I've done work for many schools over that time and so it's very interesting to see how COVID-19 is affecting those schools at this point in time. Recently we prepared a school master plan for the Alice Springs School of the Air. So the School of the Air has been running for probably around 50 years providing distance learning to an area of over 1.3 million square kilometres which um, gives some measure of what they've achieved. So they've managed to fine tune both their learning environments and their um, teaching methodology over those years to provide very successful education. Probably some of the cornerstones of their teaching is that um, their methodology is very structured. They mail out teaching, physical teaching material to their students before they carry out online learning. The students themselves have a learning environment set up in their homes and they also have some kind of tutor that might be their parents in some cases or might be a staff member if they're living on a station. Also important is the setup that the School of the Year has. So they've created a number of dedicated studios that the teachers work from. They have large monitors where the teacher can see all the students. Teachers also have a number of cameras set up in those studios so the students can see the teacher's face or if the teacher's doing some larger activity, they can see the teacher walking around, perhaps demonstrating something physical like a sport or maybe a swing with a tennis racket. Uh, the, they also have a camera mounted on the ceiling, pointed straight down at the teacher's desk. So if the teacher's writing on the desk or on a whiteboard mounted on their desk, the students can see that as though it's a blackboard. So all quite particular things that School of the Year has been operating with for many years. What I was struck by, though, was that with all this distance learning and its success, 
one of the absolutely most important things that the school stressed to me was that they have these in-school weeks where the students attend the, the school physically. So they all travel generally with their parents from wherever they are, come into Alice Springs, stay for a full week, and the school environment has to accommodate for one week a term, every single school, every, sorry, every single student who's enrolled. Um, it, this is important for the students to socialise with each other and participate in sporting activities and it generates a sense of a school community. So every school is completely different, but I think that Alice Springs School of the Year sets a fantastic example that a lot of Australian schools, urban schools could look at. So a big thank you there to Annecy, Ethan and Sue for sharing their reflections from the field from, as you can see, three really different standpoints. We're now gonna move into our first speaker. And it's my delight to introduce Professor Lindsay Oates, who's the director of the Centre for Positive Psychology at the University of Melbourne. Lindsay's gonna take us through wellbeing science and its implications for how we understand the impacts of COVID. Because of course, it's, it's affecting us in, in multiple ways. And of course, the lens that he'll provide really is how we understand this in terms of the way that we redesign or consider learning environments into the future. Thank you, Lindsay. Great, thank you, Luca. Uh, lovely to be with you all today. Uh, this is a topic which is very dear to my heart. That is, I get to talk with you about wellbeing science uh, and also the relationship between that and education and learning environments. Uh, and I'm coming to you from Melbourne, which of course has been heavily restricted during, during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and I'm in a context where I've, I've been working from home for seven months uh, with two sons, a 16 year old son, who has coped quite well uh, academically with, with the change, but hasn't coped particularly well emotionally. Whereas my second son is, is the opposite, different personality. He's coped um, quite well emotionally, but hasn't done so well academically in the, in the changed learning environments. So in the time I have with you uh, today, what I, I just wanna cover um, some of the work I've been doing, both with UNESCO uh, in, in the International Assessment of Education, uh, and also the work I do on wellbeing literacy, that is how we communicate about and for wellbeing, uh, and give you two, two particular sets of tools, one about change and, and how we talk about and think about change, particularly in the adversity in the context of, of the coronavirus. Uh, and secondly, just a little bit of what I call a bit of conceptual gardening. A lot of people talk about happiness, well-being, and they use all these terms, but they haven't actually stopped to think about what they're talking about. So I want to cover off on that and put it in the context of learning and learning environments, particularly for those of you interested in designing uh, effective learning environments. So what we have here uh, on our first slide, we, we, we've got a teacher and learner and that little virus there on, on the left-hand side. I put to you the question, what, what has the pandemic taught you? In the work we're doing uh, at UNESCO, we're looking at uh, education as a relationship between a teacher and a learner. A lot of people talk about learning and they forget, they forget about the teacher and the idea that teaching and learning is a relationship and education is a relationship between a teacher and a learner. And this is particularly important because we're not only just talking about a teacher as a physical human in the classroom, a person can teach themselves, that is autodidactic learning. Uh, they can learn from a text uh, through a technology uh, or importantly, they can learn from their environment. And in this case, I'm putting to you that the coronavirus pandemic itself uh, is, a, is a teacher. So with that definition of teacher and learner, where the teacher provokes or the environment provokes, the environment you design provokes and evokes things in the learner, also, this work has brought us to think about education and its relationship to flourishing. So if education is a relationship between the teacher and learner, what's that relationship to flourishing? People talk about wellbeing. I'm going to, I'm going to unpack in a moment the difference between flourishing, wellbeing uh, and thriving. But importantly, not only the relationship between education and flourishing, but the role of the environment, which is particularly important uh, for those of you who are designing learning environments. So going to the next slide, before I talk more about flourishing uh, and wellbeing and thriving and how that relates, I want to go back and think about uh, 
Think about the coronavirus pandemic as one example of adversity. We've been hearing about bushfires. There are many other examples of adversity. In the work we do at the Centre for Positive Psychology at the University of Melbourne, I've never had more uh, requests for resilience and resilience training. Everyone wants to talk about resilience or wellbeing since the onset um, of the pandemic. In the slide uh, you have in front of you, this is um, a recent publication that we've done on wellbeing literacy, which, as I said, is how we communicate about wellbeing and for wellbeing, and there are many examples of that. But this in particular is uh, getting you to think about, we hear words like resilience and coping and adapting. On the left-hand side there, you've got robust or this idea that I will stay strong, I will get through the storm. Um, like a, a strong house weathering itself in a hurricane, it stays there. That's, that's robust. Moving to the right, we have the idea of coping. I'm going, to, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to be okay. Adapting goes further. That is, I'm actually changing things up. So, for example, I'm learning online rather than at school. I've found a different way to learn. I've adapted. Resilience goes a little further. That is, in the long term, I'm going to get back on the trajectory I was originally on. A new notion you may not have heard of, the idea of anti-fragility. That is, actually, we get better under adversity. So if you think of hydra heads or a medusa where they get their heads chopped off and then they grow two back, that's an anti-fragile system that actually gets stronger uh, from, from adversity. And then going further to the right on this diagram, transforming is when we actually change, we change form literally. So the furthest to the right on this diagram is the idea of creating, actually creating new systems. So it's not the same as it was before. We've actually generated something new. So all of these terms uh, relate to systems change, and that might be a psychological system, so how you are psychologically. It might be the educational system, or it might be the actual environment that you're, that, that you're changing or designing under adversity. So the first thing here I'm uh, requesting you to think about is Actually, listen to these terms. People talk about adapting and coping and resilience and transforming and being agile. There's a lot of terms being thrown at, around at the moment. This schema here actually shows you um, from the left, there's the less change. To the right, there's the most change. And um, how we use this language, both about our well-being but also about our systems change, is actually really important. And I want you to think as you work through and hear the other speakers what, what, what level of change are we talking about and what language is being, uh, being used? On the next slide, um, we have a definition of human flourishing, which I've literally been working on um, for UNESCO with my colleagues for approximately eight months. Uh, I'm going to read out the whole definition, but um, the, the key message here is human flourishing is, is a complex thing and it's talking about the optimal continuing development of humans human beings' potentials. So the idea of human flourishing as, as the becoming, moving towards living one's potential. And as you can see in the definition um, at the bottom there, it is conditional on the contributions of both individuals, so the individual's psychology and who, who they are, but also relevant to what we're talking about today. It requires an enabling environment. Within that definition, it's basically saying, well, flourishing is the big process of moving towards an optimal life where we're living, moving towards our potential. We have well-being on the way, but to achieve this, we have to engage with our environment. And this brings me to the next slide where I want you to actually, rather than just saying happiness and well-being, and some people say flourishing, and they might even say thriving, a lot of people use these words interchangeably. And to me, that's like uh, talking to a microbiologist and, and calling everything a bug. Uh, this is a bit like that to a wellbeing scientist. These terms have particular meanings for us, and this is relevant uh, if we're going to go forward and think about the role of education in wellbeing and the role of learning environments uh, on people's wellbeing and their learning. So firstly, on the left-hand side there, we've got some pretty pictures of flowers. This is the, the original meaning of flourishing is to blossom. Uh, and what that's picking up on is the idea that uh, flourishing is about blossoming, it's about the flower, but actually the idea of becoming, the process of becoming something, uh, realising one's potential 
and it's, it's optimal. It sends us an optimal state and optimal also ethically. So it's, it's living a good life uh, and the best life you can live. And if we take the idea of flourishing, a flower is not the end of a cycle. It's, 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 the, it's the obvious great part, but that flower recedes and then the, the, the journey of reaching potential starts all over again. So it very much is a process. Going to the middle there, the idea of well-being comes effectively. The well comes from the idea of gush, uh, if you track it back, and being to exist. So it's literally the inside looking out. Uh, and we call it happiness some of the time, but it's, there's a bit more to it than that. But thinking of well-being as like the river as opposed to the flower. And coming to thriving, if we go to the origins of that word, uh, three foot to thrive, to take hold of the environment. So some people say, oh, thriving and happiness and flourishing, they're all the same thing. Actually not. The idea of thriving is that engagement with the environment. So uh, the roots to the tree are actually engaging with the environment to get the tree's needs met. And that's very relevant when we talk about the interplay of learning environments. How are we creating environments where people can thrive? So on that notion, I will leave you with three questions that, that derive from these different aspects of the complexity of World Bank science. So firstly, a flourishing question in the environment context or the learning environment context is how does the environment enable an optimal process of becoming? That is, how does the environment help a person move towards their potential in an ongoing way? Wellbeing question, or two particular wellbeing questions. Firstly, how do I feel in this environment? And secondly, can I live a valuable life in this environment? So there's both how we feel immediately, but there's also thinking about it more broadly in a, in a lifelong perspective in terms of wellbeing. And finally, a thriving question, how do I take hold uh, or engage with this environment? How do I effectively take hold of such an environment? So these are fundamental and formal questions about uh, flourishing, well-being and thriving, uh, but you can use them in how you think about uh, your learning contexts, designing educational environments. You can think about them as parent. The key message to me, to, from me to you is don't use them as just interchangeably because they're actually different things uh, and trying to help you broaden your own well-being literacy here in terms of how you communicate about uh, these particular things to get to get you also to think about um, how intimately related they are to education. Feeling good is one thing, but reaching your potential is another. And flourishing in particular is a concept which talks directly to that. So I will hand back to Luca. What I've done is I've tracked you through language of change uh, under adversity and tracked you through a few examples of that from robustness right through to creativity. And I've left you with some key questions uh, that differentiate between flourishing, well-being and thriving, particularly em emphasising the interaction between us as a human uh, and the environments in which we inhabit, be they social environments, technological environments or built environments. Hand back to you, Luca. Thank you so much, Lindsay. So, of course, a good academic asks questions back to us. And those are three really powerful questions to consider, you know, the difference between flourishing and well-being and thriving. And, of course, how they intersect with the learning environments that we're trying to create. You know, and ultimately, how do we all build our, our well-being literacy, not just for our students, but for ourselves, so that we can create the most powerful environments possible. We're going to dive into the field now. And... Uh, hear from two mini case studies from Xavier College, from Gawler, just north here of Adelaide, from Derek and Janet. So we'll throw to them to hear from their experiences during this time. I'm Derek Pinchbeck. I'm a Director of Teaching and Learning here at Xavier College. In the last 11 years, I've been really fortunate to be involved in a range of our building programs focused on getting students ready for 21st century learning, and in particular, that incorporation of digital technologies for them. We were doing really well in that space and staff, our readiness in terms of spaces provided open spaces that could be collaborative and really incorporated that digital stuff, particularly from an audio visual perspective. But then COVID came along and it was really the experiment that we could, could never have conducted otherwise and we gained some valuable information about our students. We learned that some students love being at school and some students struggle and perhaps not the students we expected. 
And on coming back from COVID, it was a big lesson to us on how our spaces could incorporate them transitioning back into that space. We learnt that future learning is probably going to be more of a co-collaboration between teachers and students, and that more so home will be an extension of school and we need more interoperability between those two spaces. And for those kids that did return, it was about how do these spaces make it a safe place for them? Some kids want open plan spaces that, where they can collaborate and be really relational with other students. Other students want really secluded, quiet spaces where they can feel safe. But I guess for me as a teacher, it really turned things on its head a little bit. Um, I perhaps in planning have never thought as much about outdoor spaces. Some of our kids, that relational time where they engage with the community outside the classroom is really the carrot that gets them through their school day. And it's really made me refocus on how can our outdoor play spaces get kids the enthusiasm and the energy to engage in their learning against once they're returning to those learning environments. I think there's a lot to learn from COVID and I think we're still learning. So my name is Janet Coomber and I'm, I've been employed here at Xavier for four years. I've just received a substantial position, so we have been tasked with opening a new campus out at Two Wells. What we've ended up doing is we've ended up identifying our major points that we wanted to get across, not just for the education of our students, but for the community. So some of our major priorities revolved around a real connection with the environment. So that biophilic design where we could connect outdoors with indoors. So our, our building is very large it's spacious and it's quite high. There's a lot of interconnectivity between the actual classrooms, but we have the found a sweet spot where we are able to connect with each other, connect outside, connect to breakout spaces internally, but also close off because we need to cater for sensory needs of children and the the fact is that student children need some quiet spaces as well. And we have a lot of outdoor play areas, so we've worked really hard for nature play. We've worked hard to get kind of that risky play involved again. So as children will be banging in nails and running around outside, and we've even put a bike track around the outside so that when our students come and ride to school, they've got a little bit of an adventure. Thank you so much, Derek and Janet, uh, sharing their insights there from Xavier College. Uh, we're going to now move into the built environment, and it's my pleasure again to introduce Associate Professor Ken Fisher, uh, who's going to talk about the built environment and its impacts on health and well-being, and how we can better integrate you know, the outside into the inside and these learning environments to become more expansive and more open, particularly if the option is that we can learn virtually. How does the physical experience become different, become distinct, and really maximise for social connectedness? So... Uh, Ken is actually joining us from the Australian Science and Mathematics School, and we'll also have some of the fantastic team from ASMS sharing some of their insights as well from that beautiful learning environment down there. Over to you, Ken. Thanks very much, uh, Luca. Um, it's a pleasure to be asked to speak at this event. Um, it's, uh, I guess, a classic example of what we are trying to achieve, been trying to achieve for some decades in a way, is blended learning where we have a, a virtual and physical interface. Um, what got me, I guess, into uh, designing for COVID, which is really the topic of my talk, um, was designing three schools or being the educational planner for three schools in Sydney last year and they were 3,000 student schools and it occurred to me that those schools really uh, needed a major influence of environment to, uh, I guess, to create a, a better sense of health and wellbeing. Um, so um, what we wanted to do was is, is have much more connection with nature, uh, with the learning spaces. Um, I, what my work is evidence-based and I work with the University of Melbourne and uh, we we focus really on translational research or translational design where we where we um, bring research into practice and practical problems we uh, into research the impact of the physical environment on health and well-being has been well documented and it's actually in many policy documents nationally state-wise and locally but it finds it it's, it's hard to find its um, traction in, in many projects. It works at a, a range of scales, like a national scale, um, about the environment on, on the national scale, the state scale, the, the local government, and in the school. And it's working at all these scales that we need to find evidence to 
I guess, inform our practice, our design and planning practice. Some of the evidence, for example, is uh, health indicators, that social health indicators, and the Oxford Textbook of Nature and Public Health um, has something like 60 chapters, uh, which are summaries of major research projects on the impact of, of the environment on health and well-being. There's also neuroscience, um, you know, what, how we react to the physical environment, and there's a range of research domains that inform this whole process. Terrapin have identified 14 key elements for environmental and biophilic design, uh, which we can use in our work. Um, recently, I was uh, asked to review a book on um, the design of uh, spaces, primary school spaces for health and well-being, and um, it's really reinforcing the notion, the notion of designing for health and well-being, and how COVID actually intersects with this program, which has been going on, I guess, for the last decade or so. In the Innovative Learning Environments and Teacher Change, we um, have been looking at trying to, I guess, open up the school so there's a lot more um, learning settings available for students. But that opening up also allows uh, more opportunity for design for COVID. In particular, if we borrow space, if you like, from circulation, from um, part of the library, the computer lab's no longer needed, wet areas and so on, we can actually come up with um, enough area around four square metres per student, which is, seems to be the agreed national figure for um, a safe COVID environment. The Australian Science and Math School, which um, is, I think, uh, a, a world exemplar at um, uh, blended learning and um, problem-based learning, project-based learning, is a much more flexible environment. And I'm going to ask um, Jane Heath just to uh, describe some elements of the school and also their COVID policy that they've used over the past six weeks. So I'm just going to pass over to Jane now. Thanks very much, Jane. If you could take us through your approach. Thanks, Ken. Uh, as you mentioned, the ASMS is very much a blended learning environment. Our physical and our virtual learning spaces enable us to uh, commit to a very strong sense of community um, for our students to have agency in their learning, to be self directed, to be self-regulated and to be supported to self-determine their learning and then also for this for us to have a strong sense of agency and uh, a really strong curious uh, mindset uh, goes with that. We felt well placed then when COVID hit, although there were lots of challenges, I have to admit, but we did feel that we were um, quite confident uh, to transition to more of a online learning environment uh, throughout COVID. What I would like to do is to uh, ask one of our teachers, Marcus, and one of our students, Nidhi, to share with you their perspectives of how our school community and our learning environment were able to support and guide them, uh, students, through this time. Hi, my name is Marcus Roberts. I'm the digital learning leader at the Australian Science and Mathematics School. During the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, our school continued to support students in their learning through two really important factors. One, our already existing uh, infrastructure that we have here at the school, so our online portal system in which teachers curate resources for students to access, uh, and also supplementary uh, materials such as uh, Microsoft Teams, which help students connect with their teachers and also with their peers, and also Google Apps for Education, which allowed students to collaborate in real time in documents. And the other reason that we were able to be so successful during that period was the already existing uh, culture at the school. So we place a large importance on students being self-directed in their learning and also being collaborative in their learning. So pairing that with the online resources that we have and the infrastructure allows students to be quite seamless in their learning and continue uh, to be collaborative and uh, self-directed. And it really made the physical space that we have blend into that digital space quite easily. During that period, we were quite mindful of uh, student well-being and we continue to support students through uh, things like Microsoft Teams to be able to connect to them, but also ensure that they're connected to their peers. Uh, working in an environment like ours, which is very open plan, uh, it is quite, not noisy, but there's always background noise. Students learning and enjoying their learning. Uh, and we knew that when students get into their 
their quiet space in their bedroom, that's gone. And some students were actually quite missing that if they were all gone for an extended period of time. So we uh, we provided them with a an ambient noise generator, and one of them was a uh, it was the sound of working in a sort of busy cafe. So that background noise of people bustling around was provided to them, and we got feedback that a lot of students actually really appreciated being able to use that ambient noise in the background just to feel not at home because they were at home but to feel at school which was actually really powerful and uh, they really appreciated it. One of the biggest challenges was that our school is very collaborative. Uh, we do a lot of group work and it's very kind of an open environment. Um, so yeah, we had to kind of get used to working from home, but also learning to collaborate remotely, um, which was really difficult. So we had we had Microsoft Teams and we could join Teams calls and we could collaborate through Google Docs and everything. Um, but yeah, I know a lot of people struggled not having those skills already to learn how to learn properly. <laughs> Um, so year 12s, you know, we've been at the ASMS since year 10. We've had two years to get ready, get ready for this basically. Um, and we already have a lot of the skills to be able to learn independently and look for resources and all that kind of thing. Thanks very much, Jane. That's terrific. And I just want to finish up by talking a little bit more about, um, uh, I guess the idea of bringing nature into the school or the school into nature um, by an ex example in, um, in Japan where they've really opened up the school really by opening up the walls. And in some respects that reflects the uh, designs that have been existing in Japan for millennia in terms of their sliding screens and, and having that engagement with nature. So... Um, the last school I just want to talk to is, is the Balinese uh, Green School, which is completely made out of bamboo and is probably an environmental masterpiece in a way. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, an exemplar that we would all aspire to um, if we had sufficient bamboo in Australia. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your, uh, your uh, attention and um, I look forward to some questions uh, from you. Thank you very much, Ken. Some really powerful insights there from you and also from the great team at ASMS also. Of course, this idea around nature is something that I think is really fascinating at this moment in time, because of course, we often forget that we as human beings are nature. And so when we say we've lost connection to nature, we say we've lost connection to ourselves as the wonderful Andy Goldsworthy quote would go. So, you know, that's a beautiful description, I think, of the built environment and how it kind of is becoming now more, more virtual, but actually also blended in nature. And so before we delve into technology, we're going to take a quick look at three further uh, mini case studies. But as these play, my invitation to you, if you've been sitting, you know, for the entire day now at long days to stand up, have a bit of a stretch while you kind of hear three different mini case studies from different school settings uh, here around Australia. Hello, I'm Leonie Howard, the Deputy Principal here at St John's Grammar School. Um, COVID has certainly been the ultimate disruptor for education. And now as we're moving um, to the other side of COVID, hopefully, it's exciting to um, reimagine how education might look. And I think it's really important that we're thinking about teachers' work and the way that they can best deliver their learning. For me, I found COVID um, when we went online incredibly hard because I discovered that one of the things that I use most as a teacher is just my personality being in the classroom and that natural responding to students' faces and how they're um, interacting with each other and to lose that, I really found myself um, having to go back to basics of what it meant to be a teacher and how I would um, engage with students. So I'm really hoping to see teachers' um, work being considered in how we move forward. And so some of those things is it caused so much stress and anxiety for many of our teachers of the enormous amount of work load that was increased and while they stepped up to that it's not sustainable and so as we move to a system where we engage with our learners overseas or um, where they're not able to come into classrooms and we can move into a hybrid model of online learning that needs to be done in a way that's really natural and easy for teachers so I'm imagining learning spaces where teachers can deliver to both students in the classroom and online at the same time and that that would just be a really exciting space for us to work within. 
Hello, I'm Mitchell Keegan and I'm the school captain here at St John's Grammar, um, just coming into my last few weeks of year 12. So at the start of this year, I experienced a global pandemic like many people here in South Australia and the entire world. Um, so my experiences during COVID were quite unique here at St John's because we were able to quickly transition into an online learning system. So while at home, I found that I generally was a lot more productive than I was at school because I was able to knuckle down and concentrate on my work without the distraction of break times, my friends having to move between lessons. So I was able to channel my focus into a shortened period of time, which generally increased my productivity. So I think moving forward in the future, COVID has shown us that we can have a balance between online learning and face-to-face -face learning at school. And this can uh, deepen the feedback between uh, teachers and students and also parents and teachers, which really uh, helps parents understand to a greater extent how their child is doing at school. So for example, instead of having one parent-teacher interview once a term, the, the teacher is able to continually communicate with the parents about how their child is performing at school and just in the class generally and how they are progressing as a person. So my name's Jason McKenzie um, and I work at Christie's Beach High School. Um, I teach predominantly year nines, but I do teach some SAIS with year 11s as well. Um, during COVID, there were a number of uh, complexities for our students for, for a, quite a wide range of reasons. Um, a lot of them being wellbeing uh, connections, um, and some other were definitely uh, learning needs that, that had to be met in some way, whether that was um, on paper, whether that was on a screen. Um, I think there was a lot of uh, beneficial, I guess, learning outcomes for students in, in, the, in the ways that they were engaging online. Um, so the online uh, experience for students um, allowed them to change some aspects of their learning. Um, so for instance, uh, for the students in my, in my class, I was able to record my lessons um, while also running a, uh, an online chat, um, if, that, if that kind of makes sense. So basically, students were participating as I was recording. So it was really beneficial because not only could students participate from home, um, but they could also go back and watch it. So even if they were at school and I was doing some explicit teaching um, and they said, oh, I can't quite remember what you were talking about a couple of days ago, I said, not a problem, you can go back and watch that lesson that was available on Microsoft Teams. Um, I guess there, the sacrifice that you make with online learning would be that, that um, wellbeing connection that you have from students that, that really need the one-on-one -on -one time because at Christie's Beach, we do have a number of um, learning complexities along with wellbeing complexities. Um, and there's only so much you can do from the other side of a screen. Uh, so we had a, a blended model of learning where there was a number of students participating from home and there was a number of students participating within the classroom. Um, so what that meant for us is that we had to become extremely efficient in our modes of communication, um, which I think was, was very beneficial. Um, what it meant was that instructions had to be very clear and they had to be um, able to be completed without a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, teacher instruction. Um, what that meant was I quickly had to figure out the best way to communicate with students and the, and the, and the most efficient way uh, to teach and assess. Um, and I, I think that was a, a really great learning tool for me because I quickly found out what didn't work and I uh, quickly found out what did. Um, and, you know, that, that's, a, that's a learning experience that I think will, will be a, a beneficial throughout my career um, because I had to learn a lot quicker than I usually would have to. Um, and as a result, students were able to engage in their learning from, at, uh, sorry, from home and in the classroom um, and able to work independently. Um, and so that, that independent model um, worked really well. And I think it's something that I'll implement in the future. So some really interesting insights about blended learning, virtual learning, hybrid learning. And that's what we're gonna delve into now as we invite Dr. Joanne Blenheim, who's a senior lecturer in, in digital technology uh, to share not just some of the key lessons about how we learn and where we learn, but also in terms of voice, choice, and agency, and how we've seen this remarkable acceleration, really, in the way that technology has just become embedded in the day-to-day -day workings of not just schools, but also universities and, you know, all companies um, in some particular way. So, uh, Joanne, I'll hand over to you to take us through your insights into the way that technology is really shifting in the way that we understand learning. 
Thank you, Luca. Hello, everyone. My name is Joanne Blanin, and I'm a senior lecturer in digital transformations at the Monash University here in Victoria. I'd like to spend a couple of moments and share with you what we've been learning through an ongoing research project in schools over the last eight months. While much work has been done on school learning environments, innovative spaces and pedagogy, the ways in which students use virtual spaces to accommodate their various learning and social needs has yet to be fully explored. This research project is working with a large number of teachers and students as well as parents across Victoria and is very much ongoing, particularly as we are still under lockdown here in the Melbourne metro area. However, the data has already given us some insights into the types of virtual spaces that students are seeking to engage in during remote learning. As this slide shows, students are clearly telling us that the virtual space needs to have a large range of different types of learning environments. These virtual spaces um, are replicating the physical learning environments that students have in their schools. And they are also seeking a huge increase in point of need support. There's a big demand for social spaces that enable students to have the kind of conversations they would normally have as they enter a classroom or cross the playground in the physical world. They're looking for increased ways to access support from their teachers, including, as mentioned, a huge demand for live video support. And the spaces in which this live support is provided is also becoming increasingly important to their successful learning. Students are telling us that they need a semi-formal space in which to discuss their learning. This idea of semi-formal spaces is understood to mean a balance between formal classroom instruction, where they must follow every instruction and the teacher leads the way, and a in, uh, fully informal space that is potentially more difficult and chaotic for them to navigate. This means we have um, some serious implications for how we design and use virtual spaces in the future. Whether we continue with remote learning or blended learning in some form in our classrooms, it's clear that all virtual spaces for learning need to be flexible, open, and offer a range of learning experiences. So not too dissimilar to the um, physical classroom. So having briefly explored this project, I'm asking you now to engage with a short online quiz. You'll see on the screen a link that you can go to, and this will also be provided in the chat if you'd like to click it directly. This link will take you to two images, one of an innovative learning environment and the second of an online learning management space. You're asked to have a look at the images and decide where you would choose to work in the physical world. And again, where you think you spend most time in the virtual space. You do this by clicking on the screen and leaving a small marker behind to show your preference. Hello everyone, I can see some people have already jumped in, so hopefully this is working for you. There are actually uh, two slides here, so make sure you go ahead to the next one. And I can see that people are already making choices around where they would like to work. Um, and of course, this is an activity that we have done with students as well. Um, this slide and the one on the following page. Let's see if anybody's got to that one yet. So on the second slide, you uh, there'll be an arrow button on your page. Um, how does where you prefer to work in the real world, how does that compare to where you would like to work in the, in the uh, virtual space? And of course, we're thinking about the ideas of design here. So we can see so far people um, feel they'll make, they'll spend most of their time in groups or in forums. Some people, uh, one person has chosen tests and some people in the reading list. So uh, there are a number of different affordances of this learning management system that we can see are being taken advantage of. Yeah. Interestingly, uh, not many people have gone into the polls or the frequently asked questions. And as a former uh, classroom teacher myself, that's really interesting because I know we spend a lot of time on frequently asked questions. 
So uh, feel free to continue clicking on that. But what, um, what we're noticing from you is similar to what we've noticed with uh, students in our project that's ongoing. It's currently Victoria-wide. Uh, eventually, uh, we anticipate it will be international uh, to gain an insight into what has worked across uh, the world during this crazy remote learning time. So um, let's have a look at the outcomes of the research at the moment. Thanks everyone for providing some interesting feedback there. I hope this short activity gave you a chance to reflect on what you as a learner might expect or seek out in a virtual learning space. And perhaps it gave you an insight into what others might prefer or might need as well. The question remains, what do we actually want from a virtual learning space? We've engaged with what our students want, but of course our students are not always at the peak of their understanding and there may be other things that a virtual space can offer that, we, uh, that they don't yet know about. What do we want to take back into our physical classrooms? This is a question that I get a lot at the moment from schools who are moving from remote learning back into the classroom. What have we learned from the online space that we might be able to benefit from after the lockdown finishes? To finish this short presentation, I'd like you to consider this statement and whether you agree with it or not. Design is important for effective learning online and off. The data so far from this study is telling us that design is significant to the way in which students learn in the online spaces. So despite there being no physical interactions and students still seeking to replicate a number of those actions and interactions from their classroom, they're also asking us to make everything similar to being at school, not just the spaces. Of course, the online world can never replace the physical world for human beings as we all need to engage with people and see people and faces in real life. And of course, we don't suggest that with this research. But we have a wealth of experiences drawn from the students in metropolitan Melbourne who um, have been working remotely for most of this year. And we'd be remiss to let the opportunity pass to better understand the connections between the physical and virtual spaces and the learning that they offer. Finally, the social interactions that students engage in during school hours and on the school site have clearly remained very important during the coronavirus pandemic. Student well-being, health and learning are all tied to the design of the virtual meeting spaces and their physical world. We hope that as the study continues, we can unpack what this means for online and blended learning in today's schools. Thank you very much and I'll hand back to you, Luca. Thank you so much, Joanne. I mean, it's really remarkable to consider sometimes how simple it is, you know, to start by asking the learners themselves what they enjoy when they learned when they learn best how they like to learn and of course that is all tied up into agency and into self-determination theory and this idea of you know teachers as designers or architects clearly as designers you know school leaders as design how do we use this design mindset and actually put it into a powerful frame and of course invite students into that process as well we're going to delve into our final mini case study for today and this will be from dustin fisher who's gonna share in particular some of the ways that they have used technology and platforms to continue learning throughout this moment. My name is Dustin Fisher. I'm the infrastructure manager at St. John's Grammar School. I'm responsible for all the IT within the school and, uh, and all the connectivity to the outside world. In late term one, we went to an online learning platform due to the COVID pandemic and it's presented a number of challenges for IT. Uh, that turned out to be quite serendipitous in a lot of ways. One of the opportunities the schools identified, and it is a space that we're investigating quite heavily, as many schools probably are, is the virtual learning environments or for even virtual reality. And we've identified that we, uh, there's a potential for us to create a, an entire virtual campus for the school whereby students will access um, their learning materials through portals within that campus. Um, it could be accessed from a tablet or from a, a VR headset. The envision is that the students will design the campus, uh, the virtual campus, and build it. And then that, that would, they would then walk through portals to a specific subject area. It might be English, it might be mathematics, it might be science, etc. Within that portal, there'd be um, 
VR experiences or even just straight videos or flipped lessons that they can access. Um, and also have areas where they can congregate and chat or other areas where their work can be showcased, uh, provide virtual tours for the campus as well to the public. And we see this as a really <coughs> interesting and potentially engaging opportunity uh, for students, not just in their learning in terms of the consumption of the material, but actually getting them to build the campus and to build the environment and build an environment, virtual environment that they want to work in and live in. So a really fascinating idea. How might we create a virtual campus in which students can learn when they want and how they want? I mean, that's a really fascinating idea that I think has just been accelerated by what COVID has actually offered us. Uh, and so to take us from this year, 2020, which as many of us would feel, seems like a decade long, we're gonna to go to the future now. And uh, we're not gonna dive into an organic question and answer session, a, the good old Q and A. And so of course the invitation is still there to use the chat function or to dive into the Q and A itself. I'm going to kind of host and convene this somewhat, but this is gonna be an organic conversation about you know, the ideas that matter most. And if you think about what the biggest challenge you are facing right now, what is that challenge? And how might this amazing panel of experts be able to kind of shed some light on that? Lindsay, I'm gonna to go to you first. And so I, I really would love you to unpack a little bit more the idea of language. There's been lots of activity here as we can see in the, in the chat itself. Now, when we talk about resilience, and that's a word that's thrown around a lot, why is resilience not enough? And what are those, those three concepts that you spoke to in terms of flourishing, well-being, and thriving? You know, how might we understand them in a way where we can have that shared language? Because some of the questions and comments were about you know, we might use a word, but it's not understood well enough. Like perhaps that well-being literacy hasn't been there. So we'll start with you with that question. And then I'd invite all the other panelists to unmute and also just to be able to jump in as we have this conversation. So Lindsay, I'll, I'll just get you to have a quick reflection on, on that. Why is resilience not enough? Sure. Um, firstly, resilience, um, just the idea of it, we've been hearing much more about that. Or I've had more questions about resilience in the last, during the pandemic than ever before at our centre. Everyone wants to know about resilience. And the, the, the implied message is, so we can make people resilient. Um, and our definition of resilience is really uh, dealing with adversity and then getting back on the trajectory you're on before, on the developmental trajectory. People argue whether that's bounce back or some people say bounce forward, those sorts of, those sorts of ideas or to resile. Um, I would say it's if, if it is seen as only as a property of the individual, that is somebody is resilient and we strip the individual from their environment, um, there's, there's some problems there mm. because um, pers people need environments. Um, so resilience is not enough if it's seen as only a property of the individual, um, which in the literature gets called resiliency. And there's a politics of this because if you do that, um, you're handing the responsibility to the individual um, and then you don't have to do anything with the environment. Um, so I would say it's not enough if it makes no reference to the environment. Uh, mm -hmm. And a couple of the ideas I've covered, particularly thriving and also um, flourishing, uh, uh, I've covered them today directly to get us to think more about how these wellbeing related concepts um, are to do with uh, the environmental conditions we create um, yeah. and how well people are in interacting with those environments um, to meet their needs. Uh, and concepts, economic concepts like capability uh, do exactly that. How do, we take, how do we take things and use them to transform them into things we won't need? Um, so my answer is resilience is not enough if it's construed only as a property of the individual. Um, yeah. And a lot of the discourses are doing that. Let's toughen up everybody by making them more resilient and pretend the environment doesn't exist, that is um, probably part of, part of my main comment. Yeah, fantastic, Lindsay. Um, Ken, I want to bring you in here as well, just to add to this, because you've flashed up, of course, the ecological factors for well-being, I think. And, and Lindsay, I, you know, through your work, of course, it's, not, it's the compartmentalization as opposed to the holistic view or the multidimensionality of learners or human beings, frankly, um, I think is that point that you're picking up. So, Ken, what would you say here about you know, the built environment and the idea of, you know, the ecological approach, not just in terms of bringing nature, you know, or us bringing ourselves closer to ourselves, i.e. the nature around us, 
um, but also in terms of the different factors that we might consider when we're looking at that learning environment and the role that it plays in, in enabling human beings to flourish. Although I'm cautious about using those terms now, thanks to you, Lindsay, I have to say, uh, because of the way that they, they um, yeah, because of, of what you've spoken to. But Ken, take us to that. Um, what's, what's your reflection here? Okay, I, uh, I'd like to pick up on the literacy notion because I've been big on spatial literacy probably for the last 20 years. Uh, it's starting to get some traction, uh, but um, Lindsay's mentioned uh, uh, well-being literacy or flourishing well-being literacy. Um, I think in a way we need to start looking at a language around, uh, around uh, designing for uh, health and well-being, and biophilia and biourbanism are two two terms that seem to be getting some traction. Um, and around that, there's a whole range of uh, literacies, and to some extent, they I'm going to have to go back and look at Howard Gardner's multiple literacies, of which spatial literacy was one, and digital literacy. Um, and so, I think um, to to unpack that a bit. Uh, what I was saying earlier, I think, about the schools that I was educational planner for in Sydney, these really large schools, it seems to me we need to build into those schools some notions of rest restorative spaces. Um, and before I go into those just a little bit further, um, mm -hmm. we've, we've got in our research centre, Learn the Learning and Environment Supplied Research Network at Melbourne Uni, we've got quite a lot of work around trying to measure Learning, student learning outcomes related to the design of the learning environment. And uh, we, we're making some significant progress, but it occurred to me that if people have a sense of a high sense of well-being and, and, and are healthy, they're actually going to learn better. So that's why I sort of shifted my gaze a bit more into the design of the physical environment for, 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 um, for health and well-being. And so I, um, I mean, I, I haven't got time really to go into it in depth, but cer certainly restorative spaces are critical. Um, we spend a lot of time concentrating and looking at screens and packed in space, packed in rooms and inside buildings. And it seems to me we need to have a lot, a lot more links to the outdoors, a lot more courtyards, inner courtyards, um, even outdoor rooms, um, outdoor spaces to learn. Um, so I, I think, and COVID, I, I sort of, this was last year and then COVID came along and I think it's sort of turbocharged that need to have, yeah. have um, more, uh, more movement, more flexibility, and I suppose just to just to finish off before I ramble on too long, the notion of active learning as opposed to passive learning. And I mean, all too long has passive learning existed in schools and it's time we uh, we got it far more active. Uh, so um, that's, I guess, where I'm uh, I'm heading with my research. And uh, I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> no, it's, it's fascinating, Ken, of course, and other cultures do things really, you know, quite interesting things like forest bathing. You spoke to the Japanese built environments and the idea of there being cultural principles of, you know, immersing oneself within nature. And we know now the restorative impact that that has on our, on our attentional capacity, for example, which is compromised for all of us right now because of the low level anxiety in our world. I want to bring Joanne in here as well. There's a great question here from David Kilpatrick mm. that really taps into, I think, and you know, what Ken and Lindsay have just spoken about, which is the idea of the off-campus learning environment being different from the school learning hub. Of course, knowing that social connectedness matters so much, you know, and I think Lindsay made a comment that it's, you know, the most reliable psychological predictor of well-being. You know, how do we think about blended, you know, models here? And, and where, where do we pay attention, you know, rather than trying to shape the remote space to be the school? Like how, how, could, how can we think about that intelligently? Yeah, well, that's what my current research project is looking at. So I guess uh, wait and see a little bit. But what we do know <laughs> is that um, social interaction has to be structured in more of a formal way in the online environment than in the classroom or in the school or on the premises even. Um, and so we know that um, design is really important in the online space, but the the considerations around the design for something like a blended approach. So we've got schools here in Melbourne who are thinking about permanently moving to a blended learning approach where students come perhaps Mondays and Fridays to school, Tuesdays and Thursdays they work and Wednesdays 
um, they work from home and Wednesdays they're out um, doing placement. So they could be um, out with the ranger. Um, I'm, I'm in the Yarra Valley, just on the edge of Metro Melbourne. Um, and so I have the advantage of, of space out here, but the, what the virtual world can offer is a bridge between home and school, I think. And that, um, that intersection of those two spaces can be facilitated by the online so that it's not either or, it's actually both and something different. So that we can um, look at um, the students' voices and choices in schools, which we already do with new learning environments and new processes, and also um, thinking about the way that we ensure students do have agency that Anna was talking about in the chat. Um, and also, I think that the online space, I loved Ken's, um, which I have read before, um, his phrase, was it Ken or it might be Lindsay? Uh, quote around what level of change are we asking for and for me that is what what are we asking for of the online space and this year it's hard to say because there was no preparation um yeah. there's a there's a lot of um, backwards planning and a lot of uh, last minute decisions about how to present learning and teaching so hopefully this, the research we're currently doing will will make that into a learning opportunity that we can apply but there's definitely a space for some sort of blended learning that doesn't replicate either fully at home or you know, on another site or replicate the school there's a place for this virtual that connects these learning environments for different uh, purposes yeah great uh, so bringing you in as well here Jordan so this idea of technology and of course most I think most educators um, myself included admit you know it really wasn't an emergency response and I think should be commended for their ability to pivot you know and change pedagogy really quite rapidly but of course, the question is now, what, 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 how do we iterate on top of that? How do we make that better? And so the idea rather of just substituting technology for the analog, how does it kind of redefine and transform, which I think, you know, in your session, obviously, you've, sp you've spoken to. There's also a question here, Jordan, that you might want to pick up on, which is the idea of, you know, neurodiversity or, um, you know, young people with disabilities and, and the way that technology can actually, you know, augment their experience um, so that they can access particularly things that may not have been easily accessible previously. So what's your reflections on where technology is taking us, but also how we can in, in the education space intelligently use it for the, its maximum impact as opposed to there's, there's a, a laptop or there's a piece of technology um, and just substituting out. Absolutely, yeah. The, this year we all got thrown into this space of, of trying to figure out how we were going to change the way that we all connected. I mean, businesses were the same. And, uh, and something that was uh, interesting from my perspective was that I've been working remotely for a very long time. I, I run my business here in Sydney whilst traveling around the world. And, uh, and I was working remotely for a long time, but I was also saying to a lot of companies who have that ability to go remote and go virtual as well, that if you're gonna go virtual, do it part-time if you can, uh, try not to do it completely full-time because people crave people interaction. We need to be able to have that face-to-face -face interaction and neuroscience has shown uh, many new areas uh, emerging of research that are starting to find uh, you know, have been finding for a very long time, the impact of us looking into each other's eyes, of seeing smiles, of seeing people in person. Now, this can happen to a certain degree over technology, but uh, I often say, you know, as someone who loves technology and is always trying to find the opportunity within it and see where the positives of a lot of these advancements are, I also mm -hmm. say, you know, we shouldn't automate things just because we can. And, uh, and really using this, this whole system, this online system of being able to connect with each other, being able to learn, it only goes so far. And I think we've, we've started to realize that there's a lot that's lacking in what happens in our brains when we have face-to-face -face connection, when we meet with someone, look into their eyes, the amazing things that happen in our brain, uh, are some of the, the incredible things that I've loved about so many um, uh, levels of research in neuroscience. A friend of mine, Dr. Fiona Kerr, has looked into this for a long time, about how when we look into each other's eyes, our brain instantly produces new neurons specifically for that person as a part of neurogenesis. Um, the, the ability for us to see other people smiling as well and then our brain um, uh, has different neurons that are just sitting there waiting to see smiles and they go off, they fire, they have a party. Um, I love seeing that sort of research because it's an amazing thing to realise the connections that we have when we have face-to-face, in-person uh, connections and that comes across a lot in the learning. Now where things are going at the moment and where they seem to be 
been moving and shifting and, and changing. We've had these online systems for quite a long time. We've had the ability to have video calling and video conferences. They weren't as popular until we were suddenly thrown into it and had to adapt to it and suddenly classrooms were going into it, but they weren't built specifically for classrooms and for learning. So this is something that we're starting to see some shifts and changes in. We're starting to see a lot of funding going into uh, businesses and, and small businesses through to those who are suddenly becoming very well funded to build better virtual learning environments. And, uh, and that is through laptops, that is through the computer screen, sorry to say for many people, but it's done better. Um, all the way through to where the technology is advancing to, like some of the things that we showed in uh, extended reality technology. From virtual reality, not everyone wants to slap a box on their face. And, uh, you know, that could be with the smartphone, you know, but sometimes that can make you feel a bit sick having that on your, on your face, trying to have a virtual learning environment there, through to uh, the idea of uh, augmented reality technology, which is still very expensive, not accessible just yet, but it's starting to move in that direction. Now, one thing that we need to think about when we look at the transitions through to this future is how do we make everything, our learning environments, as well as our educational systems, even more inclusive than ever before. And it's something that has been a change that I've noticed in the last five years. I've been well in, and truly in that space, uh, looking at how technology can be made more inclusive, because it's often not built that way from the ground up. If we look at the, the inclusion of, uh, of people with disability, physical disability, something that we've looked into for a long time, especially high level physical disability. Uh, in Australia, we've got one in five Australians that have some form of, of disability and about one in 16 have severe or profound disability. So about one in 16 Australians. And so what we need is new, um, new types of, of tools. Sometimes we've got laptops that have things like eye trackers, devices that we can already find out there, put it onto a, a tablet PC, it tracks where your eyes are looking, a person can communicate through that. So knowing the technologies that are out there are allowing us to be more inclusive with how we build these environments. Uh, and at the same time, including uh, through through virtual uh, chats, through virtual uh, classrooms, it suddenly allows that technology to be utilised in that way. But at the same time, when we're building these new environments, when we're building, whether it's virtual or physical, always think about inclusion. And I think that's uh, what's going to create a much yeah. brighter future for our learning environments. Yeah, I like this idea, you know, how do we treat all people as whole people, the idea of multidimensionality. And I think that's a key theme yeah. that's coming across here. And of course, you know, what is the tool required for the learning that, we are designing as opposed to, you know, and so how is that driving it as opposed to just becoming about the technology rather than the human side of that trans, you know, how is it transformative as a catalyst in some ways? Uh, I just wanted to dive into um, just really briefly, because we only have a few minutes left. Um, what would be your reflection, uh, each of you, on this moment in our, in our collective human journey you know, what's the reflection from your vantage point? What do you think will be forever changed because of this? And, and what is the kind of question or the, the reflection that you want to share about where we might be heading, particularly, you know, with your, with your domain of expertise, be that well-being science, be that the built environment, be that the blended learning or the technological transformation or, or the future. Um, and so I'm going to reverse this maybe, Jordan. We might even start with you. Um, what would be, yeah, what... From your work, where, where do you hope? But also what's your kind of take home message for all the people that joined us today? So what I've been talking about, the fact that we're moving into this realm of the imagination right now, and I think that is probably the most exciting thing. Like I say, we've got to start with inspiration. We've got to dream big. And these big dreams, is it's where the ideas come from. When we generate these ideas of how we can build this, this new world, build this new future and utilise the tools, we can figure out what works for us, what is uh, actually working in this, uh, in this year, what sort of tools we're utilising, which ones we want to see advance, which ones we want to roll back and maybe go back to the way it was, but start to think, reset, think about the future that we want to move into and collectively build that because we all have a say in where technology is going. We're moving at the fastest rate of change we've ever seen. So this means that we can actually steer and shape that change as individuals, collectively, as organizations, as schools, we have the ability to shape that change now more than ever before. So if we can shape that change, figure out where we want to go together, make it inclusive and realize that we're moving into the realms of the imagination. So I think it's uh, that's the exciting part of it make sure that our students and our teachers are thinking big and dreaming big. 
Yeah, that's great, Jordan. Of course, you know, what will the future be? It will ultimately be what we choose to make it, which is that piece around agency again, like a really key theme, I think, in the way that where learning is going. Um, Joanne, what about your reflections? Um, I guess the thing, the, the biggest thing for me, yeah, I mean, thinking about how remote learning and blended learning has been positioned this year because of COVID is um, the phrase, never waste a good crisis. So um, I would ask people to think um, about how do you make the most of these challenges we've faced? Everybody and every teacher you speak to uh, globally really has, has had faced challenges this year. How do we make the most out of that? How do we find a silver lining? Not just for the sake of finding a silver lining, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> but for, uh, to inform as we go forward so that we don't lose the momentum we've gained where every teacher has been positioned as a technology user. Um, and I challenge people to think big about what can I bring with me from the um, offline experience into the online world and potentially the other way. But what, what will you pack in your bags once COVID is under control? Um, yes, um, Churchill did say that. I did steal it, of course. I uh, never wasted a good crisis. But um, there, um, what would you pack in your bags when the world goes back to COVID normal? What will you take with you so that you haven't wasted this crisis? Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, Ken, we're doing this, I suppose, backwards mapping. So um, what about your offering for the group? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because what's happening is a trend towards uh, schools having more students and schools going vertical. And I find that a real worry that uh, there's actually a webinar just on an hour or two ago on vertical schools. And uh, it seems to me we really need to look at the amount of space that's allocated. We, we've got to move from the two square metres of student in a classroom to four square metres in student in a, in a floor, a whole floor. Yeah. And, uh, and we've got to take down walls and we've got to knock walls out into nature. And we've got to bring nature in where we can. And, um, I mean, when you're looking at high rise and when you're looking at buildings that are already built, um, we can perhaps take a leaf out of Singapore where they... They just bring in parks on, you know, their parks every 10, 10 storeys, uh, two storey high parks within a building. So we've got to wow. we've got to go that direction, I believe. Fabulous. And Lindsay, what's your take home message for? for My take home message is really to to seriously think about where I started COVID as a, as a teacher. Uh, and if we actually look at restrictions and again, I'm in Melbourne, so this has really been live. Uh, Dalai Lama once took a car apart to, to see how it worked and then put it back together again. In some ways, the restrictions from the pandemic have done exactly the same. This systematically dismantled society and what we can and can't do. Uh, and the big one that people have really suffered with is the loss of social connection. Um, and so that's taught us a lot. Um, we, we already knew, wellbeing scientists knew that. A lot of people knew that relationships drove wellbeing, but people have now experienced it. So as we speed up... Um, technologically and because of COVID as a catalyst, um, it's, it's loosened what's possible and it's loosened how we think about a lot of things. When we start to put society and the economy back together again, that's where the choice points are. Uh, and that's where, so Jordan's technology innovations, I was listening to Jordan thinking, how do we take that to scale? So how do we get that into 2,340 schools in New South Wales? The public, you know, how to, the big start, big use of it, shared use of it. Um, but the choice point uh, of COVID as a teacher, now that it's taught us more, it's like this huge health promotion campaign to teach everyone about wellbeing. Um, and we know the environment matters and we know relationships matters. And we've got to take that forward as a collective uh, to build that new society and community that we, uh, that we not only need, but we are collectively yearning for. Yeah, fantastic. Uh... Look, thank you to all of you, uh, to Lindsay, Ken, Joanne and Jordan for providing your insights. Thank you also to those that provided, you know, really the stories on the ground where the interface between these ideas and the reality, the beautiful human systems of learning ecosystems is actually taking place every day. So to the students and the teachers and the other professionals that contributed there, that's brilliant. Thank you to 2OC Productions for putting this remarkable webinar together and also to Walter Brook, which has uh, been where we've hosted this on Ghana country here in Adelaide. Uh, and thank you to you for joining us. I mean, this really is a remarkable time and speaking frankly, you know, and more online time is, is sometimes the last thing that we want after a long day. Um, but I really hope that this has been really valuable and you've seen some of the new ideas in the way that we're going, because I think 
this moment, our, our greatest challenge is not that, you know, we might miss it. It's that we won't be bold enough. And to your point, Lindsay, taking this to scale, to using the powerful innovations of technology, you know, to create accessibility, Jordan. You know, Joanne, to actually think quite differently about the way that we do deliver, uh, deliver virtual experiences. And Ken, to connect it all together with, you know, where we are in place, um, not being able to travel internationally right now, for example. So thank you all. Uh, and we hope that you journey well onwards in the way that you contribute to education across Australia and New Zealand for those that join from there. And we hope to join uh, that you'll join us again at some point in future for another webinar. Thanks all.